we're now onto the final section of the chapter, uh, the distribution of the sample mean. There are two theorems that I believe form the cornerstone of probability and statistics. These theorems are the law of large numbers and the central limit theorem. The law of large numbers guarantees us that the central that the sample mean approximately equals the population mean, while the central limit theorem describes the distribution of the sample mean for large n when we do in fact have a mean and a variance. So here are the theorems. The law of large numbers says that if we have a sequence of numbers, uh, which are iid, and uh, they have a mean of mu, so remember their iid, so the mean of the first one is the mean of, the, of, of all of them. And we will say that x bar n is a cumulative mean. So as you increase observations, you're going to add those observations to the mean. Um, so we have basically this uh, sample mean. You can think of x bar n. Uh, you have uh, um, mu and uh, x bar n is going to be uh, the mean as you add more observations to your sample, um, keeping all of the previous ones. Um, so we have this sequence of uh, means, then the probability that the random sequence x bar n converges to mu is one. Uh, to translate that, that's saying that the probability that the limit as n approaches infinity, uh, x bar n uh, is equal to mu, is equal to one, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but you can basically under the, understand this as meaning that the sample mean is going to be very close to the population mean, and it gets even closer as you increase your sample size. Right. So as you increase your sample size, the mean will be and uh, will be a better and better uh, um, estimator for the population mean. It will have a it, it, it will be even closer the more data you have and if you could have infinite data then the sample mean of that infinite collection of data would be the population mean so um, this is actually do you remember discussing the uh, frequentist interpretation of probability theory where we were talking about long-run frequencies since a sample proportion is in fact a sample mean uh, what we've effectively written down uh, with this theorem is the um, uh, the is the frequentist uh, interpretation of uh, what probability means, where we have some true p and we have sample proportions p hat, and the sample proportions as you repeat the number of trials are going to converge to the population proportion. Okay, uh, so that is the first uh, cornerstone theory uh, theorem sorry um, which says that the sample mean is a very good estimator for the population mean in the sense that um, it does estimate it and you can get an improved estimator by adding more data these the next theorem is the central limit theorem under the same assumptions as the law of large numbers uh, so we're talking about an iid sequence of random variables and their mean is mu but we're going to add an additional assumption, which we didn't make for the law of large numbers, that the variance is equal to sigma squared, then the CDF of, um, of uh, x bar n minus mu divided by sigma over root n. So basically, uh, you might know this as a z-score. Some of you may have known or heard of z-scores before. If you haven't, that's fine. Uh, but basically, it's the sample mean, but subtract out the mean of the population, and then divide by sigma over the square root of n, which is known to be the standard deviation of the sample mean, uh, regardless of whether the sample mean is normally distributed or not. Um, so subtract out the sample mean's uh, po uh, expected value, divide by its standard deviation. This uh, will then be a number with mean zero and standard deviation one for every sample size. Okay. Um, so take this quantity and it's CDF. You can understand this probability as being the CDF of, um, uh, 
uh, x bar n minus mu divided by sigma over root n. So look at its CDF. The CDF at z converges to the CDF of a standard normal random variable at z. And this is true for all z. So in other words, the distribution of the sample mean is approximately a normal distribution with mean mu and standard de deviation sigma over square root of n. And this, approximate, and this approximation is improving as your sample size grows very large, goes to infinity. And in fact, we were seeing the central limit theorem at work in section three, when we were looking at simulated statistics, when we were looking at simulated sample means computed from the uniform distribution. Uh, those were sample means that didn't start normally distributed. Um, in fact, they never were at any point normally distributed, but the normal distribution was a very good approximation for what their actual distribution was. And that approximation got better as we increased our sample size. So you can start to treat the sample mean as if it is in fact normally distributed for large sample sizes. So um, yeah, uh, that's, that's basically what the central limit theorem is saying. Uh, the central limit theorem uh, compared, so the, so the Lavage number says uh, the sample mean is going to be very close to the population mean. Uh, it's going to converge to the population mean. The central limit theorem says more than that. The central limit theorem describe, says not just that the sample mean is going to be very close to the population mean, which is encapsulated in the standard deviation being sigma over root n. Uh, it says not just that. It is also saying what the shape of the distribution of the sample mean starts to look like as you increase your sample size. Um, and it's really a statement about the behavior of sums of independent and identically distributed random variables. It's more a statement about that. Like we phrased it in terms of sample means and it is traditionally phrased in terms of sample means, but really the underlying phenomena that we're studying is the behavior of sums of IID random variables. So um, in a sense, you actually have a statement not just about sample means, but about sums of IID random variables and sums of IID random variables are all over the place it turns out. And this, and this theorem, in fact, it explains why certain distributions like the binomial distribution, the Poisson distribution, the gamma distribution, the chi-square distribution can be approximated with, normal with the normal distribution. It explains, going back to that chapter on the normal distribution, why we had those approximations. And that's why I was willing to even discuss those approximations, even though in many in many ways, those approximations are kind of obsolete in the day, and in, in the day of um, uh, computers, you don't actually really use those for computing probabilities anymore, uh, since you can just ask a computer to get the probability of the actual random variable you're working with. So they're not as useful as they used to be, but the fact that they exist is extremely interesting and still relevant. Um, it's still very important to know that. Uh, that um, sums of random variables start to look like uh, normally distributed random variables. Um, so, yeah. The central limit theorem is honestly my favorite uh, theorem in uh, probability theory uh, because it's so powerful. What the central limit theorem says is uh, the sample mean starts to forget whatever the original distribution of the data was and starts to look like it was and start to resemble a normal distribution and the implications of the central limit theorem are very deep and statisticians and probabilists are still getting more and more results uh, that are essentially central limit theorem type results so it is still something that is being actively developed uh, like like we have this theorem and it actually was proved in my my understanding is that the central limit theorem as it currently exists uh, we had versions of the central limit theorem for binomial random variables that was proved long before the full central limit theorem. We had it for specific cases, and there was a suspicion um, among uh, mathematicians and statisticians that the central limit theorem was true long before we actually had it in its full strength and glory. 
uh, where if you have a sample variance, um, and re regardless of whatever the underlying distribution of the data was, you get this uh, limiting result. Um, and yeah, it's it's a theorem that I greatly appreciate myself. It's my favorite theorem. Uh, I even said that on Reddit once. Like there was a there was a a thread in uh in, in the R math subreddit where it's like, what's your favorite theorem? And uh, I said, I'm a statistician, and my favorite theorem is the central limit theorem. And then some random Reddit user said, LOL, hello, Curtis. <laughs> so they totally called me out. The fact that they said the central limit theorem is my favorite theorem was uh, what was uh, apparently enough to identify me. Which means, if you're in my class, uh, you should probably expect at least one uh, question that uses the central limit theorem in any quiz or test. Um, uh, well, not any quiz, but in quizzes and tests, you should probably expect the limit theorem, uh, the central limit theorem to show up at some point because it's an extremely powerful theorem and you can do a lot with it. So, um, yeah. Uh, all right. So, um, uh, so thanks to the central limit theorem, we can describe the distribution of the sample mean or even, uh, just sums of random variables without really saying anything about what the exact distribution of the data is. So just say what the mean is and what the variance is, and then you've got enough to be able to at least approximately compute probabilities for the underlying phenomena. Since the central limit theorem says that the actual distribution of the data gets forgotten by sums and, and means. So here's an example. The average customer visiting a grocery store spends X dollars the expected value of X is 50 and the standard deviation of X is 55. Um, uh, and it's uh, kind of funny here. Uh, X is non-negative because you can't spend negative dollars at the grocery store. But the standard deviation of X is greater than the expected value of X. So it's unlikely that the distribution of X is a symmetric distribution. Uh, it's probably more likely that the distribution of X is skewed in order for the, something like this to happen. Uh, it's suggesting that there's probably some customers who spend a lot of money at the grocery stores. But this can, in fact, happen. And if you're going to be using the central limit theorem, it's not a problem. You, you, you're not really all that concerned about the fact that standard deviation is greater than the mean. Um, so, uh, so, so, yeah, uh... Let's uh so we're going to say every month about 30,000 purchases are made at the grocery store. If that's the case, what will be the approximate distribution of the average purchase x bar and according to the central limit theorem, uh x bar's distribution is approximately. Remember, I I'm, I'm not saying um I'm not saying that the data is act that, that this is the actual distribution of x bar. I'm saying this is an approximate distribution. So X bar's distribution is approximately a normal distribution. Its mean is going to be 50 and its standard deviation is going to be 55 divided by the square root of 30,000 since 30,000 is the sample size here. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, that's the first part. And, and for what it's worth, um, if the data were normally distributed, then this wouldn't be an approximation. This would be the exact distribution of X bar. The thing, though, is I know for a fact that this data is not normally distributed. It cannot possibly be normally distributed since uh, the standard deviation is larger than the mean and negative purchases are just not possible. Which, for what it's worth, um, you could say, well, um, since the normal distribution is a random is uh, distribution from Nick infinity to infinity. It's impossible for anything. That's, uh, uh, it's impossible for any ran, uh, any phenomena that cannot take negative values to be normally distributed. That's true. But the thing is, uh, the region on which the, the normal distribution is, uh, negative could be so, so infinitesimally, uh, small in terms of probability that we would say essentially the phenomena is normally distributed regardless of that fact. Um, regardless of the fact that it's uh, just a, that you're just going to cut it off at a uh, at, at at zero, so uh, it's it is still worth essentially it is still worth pointing out uh, that 
this data is particularly that this uh, random variable is particularly non-normal. So uh, next, what is the approximate probability that the revenue of the grocery store in a month is less than uh, one million four hundred eighty-five thousand? All right. Um, let's have the random variable r. Uh, we'll use this random variable to be the revenue. So, or we'll say revenue. So the revenue is uh, uh, the uh, total amount of purchases made at the grocery store. So the revenue is n times x bar. So um, if you had a the uh, so the total amount of purchases divided by the number of customers will get you the average purchase. But n times x bar is just going to be the number of purchase. It's just to be the cumulative sum of purchases. All right, and n x bar is equal to r, and r then is going to follow approximately uh, a normal distribution with mean thirty thousand times fifty because we've multiplied the distribution of the sample mean by 30,000, or we've multiplied the sample mean by 30,000, so we're gonna multiply its mean by 30,000, okay? And its standard deviation is going to be uh, 55 times the square root of 30,000. Again, due to the fact that we've multiplied the sample mean by 30,000, so that means it's a uh, standard deviation is going to be 30,000 times whatever it was before. Okay? So if that's the case, then the probability that the revenue is less than um, 1,485,000, uh, which is, I mean, it's, um, uh, oh, by the way, maybe I should actually write down what these numbers come out to be that might make them easier to understand. So this is 1.5 million. All right, and the standard deviation is about uh, 9,526, uh, we'll say 0. Uh, 0.279. Although I think that at these scales, uh, three decimal places might be excessive uh, precision. Okay, so anyway, uh, so we're asking for the probability that R is less than 1,485,000. R is still essentially a discrete random variable. So technically we should care about the fact that um, uh, R is less than as opposed to less than or equal to. I just don't. Because at these scales, any sort of probability is just going to, like any effect on probability is going to be extremely small. So this is going to be, according to the central limit theorem, uh, approximately the, well, okay, this is not because of the central limit theorem. This is just because of numerical approximations. Uh, so this is approximately equal to the probability that um, R minus its mean, which is 15 million, no, 1.5 million, uh, divided by uh, the standard deviation, which is 9,526.279, uh, is less than negative uh, 1.57. And this is the point where we do use the uh, central limit theorem and say this is approximately the CDF of the standard normal uh, curve, evaluated at negative 1.57. And you can figure out what that is, uh, but in the end, it's going to be approximately 0.0582. Okay, uh, and and uh, that's that's it. So yeah, yep, that's what it is. So okay, um, this is uh, just uh, getting like the standard deviation of x bar. Um, and also working with uh, the uh, distribution of revenue. It's kind of nice that you're able to get a probability for the revenue without really saying anything about what distribution the revenue came from. 
so or what distribution the the uh, purchases actually came from but you're still able to say uh, a pro the probability about where your revenue is probably going to end up okay all right so that is it for chapter five uh, I'm going to move on next uh, to chapter six we've pretty much dis ended our discussion on uh, probability theory in and of itself right so probability theory um, separate from statistics now we're going to start using probability theory for statistics and we are re-entering discussions about statistics in this class so um, chapter six is about point estimation it's saying all right we have these parameters these population parameters and we want to estimate them how should we do that uh how exactly how what, what is a good way to estimate population parameters uh that is uh what chapter six talks about chapter seven talks about confidence intervals uh and uh, confidence intervals are saying we've got point estimates but we know that point estimates are incorrect uh, there's no way that a point estimate is ever going to hit the population number right on the nose so about how far away is our point estimate from the true population parameter if we have a point estimate how should uh, what should we believe about the location of the true parameter that's what um chapter seven is about when we're talking about confidence intervals and then there's a chapter eight which is about uh null hypothesis testing uh, so that's pretty much the third topic that we're going to be talking about uh, in this course and uh, null hypothesis testing is okay uh, we're going to go from just trying to say where some parameter is to deciding between two competing statements about that parameter and making a decision about where that parameter should be uh, I doubt that I'm going to talk about chapter 9 only because I don't have an assignment on it in my class and after making these videos I'm really tired. I have been sprinting through them in, a, in the course of a few weeks, and I'm sure that by the time I get to Chapter 9, I'm just going to want to move on to my own personal projects, uh, my own research projects, that I, which I have put on hold for the most part in order to compute these... No, not compute. Uh, record these videos rapidly uh, and just get them out of the way because I want to be done with them. So, all right. That's kind of the plan for me over... Uh, for for the next few for the next while and uh all right well uh i will see you guys later <laughs>